historically fraternities were the outsiders, and if not the outsiders, the enemy. People have always wondered whether or not they should be here. Many of them had to meet in secret. Fraternities were formed to create worlds of private pleasure. Advantages of a fraternity are who throws the best party. That means who has the best music, who has the best looking women. I kind of felt like when I walked in there, I was kind of like a trophy girl. And guys were just kind of checking me out. We're geared to hang in packs like dogs. And that's fraternity life. I joined a chapter that hazed. One person who gets hurt is one person too many. It doesn't take a whole bunch of people uh, to make it a big, bad problem. Fraternities are an easy target, you know, to kind of knock down, and all I would say is that it was a rich time for me. It's more of a lifetime thing. You know, even in death, we have an Omega chapter because, you know, we don't die, we just change chapters. College fraternities are as American as apple pie. They've been a central part of campus life for almost two centuries. Perhaps it's the girls and the parties, or perhaps because fraternities may be the key to power and success. We're about to take a rare inside look at how this unusual world of privilege began and how it operates today. Fraternity is another of the institutions that perpetuate privilege in the society. There's a vast alumni network that you can tap into. It, it can absolutely uh, help shape your career. For many of its members, a college fraternity is much more than a good old boys network. It is the ultimate network. 19 of the last 32 U.S. presidents were members of fraternities. So are many current senators, congressmen, and Supreme Court justices, as well as one out of every four Fortune 500 CEOs. The bonds forged among these men all begin on a college campus. In a university situation, sometimes you can get lost, and to go someplace where everybody knows your name doesn't mean you have weak character, but it's a very gratifying, it's very gratifying to go from knowing no one to having the feeling that 50 people want to know you. Those bonds can last a lifetime and shape our politics, our economy, our culture, our future. But are fraternities really all about character, leadership, and brotherhood, or something a little less noble? I was like, oh my god, there are frats. I can go to frat parties. It'll be like in a movie or something. Grab a brew. Don't cost nothing. That's an extreme case of fraternities. People can't live that lifestyle and, and be a student. They'll come in for a semester and they'll party like they lived in the animal house. They soon find themselves back at home or at a community college uh, trying to get their grades back in order. Two centuries ago, fraternities bore little resemblance to the animal house image of today. There were the Greek letters, secret mottos, and ritualistic handshakes. But the ideals of early fraternities were in truth, service, loyalty, and love of wisdom. Not in parties, girls, and the love of a keg. One of the oldest and largest fraternal organizations in the world began in the Middle Ages by the Masons who built the great European cathedrals. By the 18th century, they had evolved into social societies and admitted non-craftsmen called accepted Masons. They created the complex system of rituals and symbols still in use today. By the mid-18th century, Masonry had traveled to the New World. Freemasonry took on a separate life there a colonialized and Americanized life, if you will, and the most prominent Americans became Freemasons. Including, it's believed, George Washington, Ben Franklin, and other signers of the Declaration of Independence. In the late 18th century, college was largely for upper-class young men preparing for the ministry, medicine, or law. But for them, life was anything but easy. They uh, lived in dorms. No running water, no, no heating system. It was something of a Spartan existence. I think there was a basic need for togetherness. There had to be something outside of the dreariness of the college life in the, the 1800s, that there was a need for friendship. Students endured a bleak, monotonous routine of prayer, study, more prayer, sleep, and more study. It was a curriculum that didn't seem to have much bearing on their life. 
Uh, they came to college having enjoyed a fair amount of independence, and all at once they were forced into a, a role of being children. Students had little say about their personal and academic lives. Rarely was there an animated exchange of ideas in the classroom, where reciting memorized text was considered the height of intellectual achievement. The American universities were kind of patterned more like uni uh, European universities, where the professor is king. And the idea that a student can even ask a question was not very much allowed in those days. But today on college campuses, students have unparalleled freedom. They come here uh, as 18-year-olds, and they're, for the first time, they, are, uh, they have time on their hands. Uh, the parents aren't physically here. Um, they have money. They're dealing with a lot of different things. History and tradition are deeply woven into the fabric of fraternity life. Nowhere is that more apparent than at the University of Mississippi. Founded in 1848, Ole Miss today is generally considered one of the great universities in the South, ranking among the top in the U.S. in its production of Rhodes Scholars. With African Americans making up 13% of the student body, Ole Miss has come a long way from the Jim Crow days of 1962, when U.S. Marshals and National Guardsmen had to protect James Meredith from a rioting mob as he enrolled as the university's first African American student. The first fraternity was founded here two years after the university opened its doors. Today, a third of its almost 13,000 undergraduates have joined one of the 19 fraternities and 13 sororities on campus. I love this place. Many of their families have strong ties to Ole Miss that go back generations. It's without question that I want to join a fraternity. I want to feel like I'm part of something special. You need a group of people that you can hang out with, people you can count on and trust and you know, tell everything and tell anything to them. Karin Foose is a 19-year-old freshman from Mobile, Alabama. He's also a legacy, someone whose brother, father, or other relative has been a member of that fraternity. Curran plans to join one, maybe Phi Delta Theta, because that's just what the Fooses do here. My brother's a fourth generation Phi Delta, then my dad, Don Foose, was a Phi Delta, and then his dad, Sam Foose, was a Phi Delta, and then my great-grandfather, Samuel Foose, was a Phi Delta. I feel pride coming from a big Foose family tradition. Our family is very, very close. The Fido connection runs very deep in my family. 21-year-old Ransom Foose, Curran's brother, is a junior and is following the family tradition of Phi Delta Theta. He's hoping Curran will too. Curran's in a unique situation. I think he wants to prove to himself that he can get a bid somewhere else. You been anywhere yet? Kept seeing. The pot, you talk about pot? got some parties. Oh yeah, let me throw it down. And he's not just getting a bid here because he's my brother. In high school I played uh, football, basketball, and baseball. He was on the football team as a freshman with me, and he was two-time All-State, and one of them was on a broken leg. And they won the state championship, which is pretty much unheard of. So F prime of X is what? I'm a major in business, and I'm thinking about maybe going to graduate school and being an architect, or I'm going to be a lawyer and maybe a work back with my dad. When current pledges, when and if current pledges here, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. I think there is a responsibility to something larger than yourself when you're in a fraternity. I, I like that. Matt McKenzie is a senior and the president of this Phi Delta Theta chapter. He was recently honored as the Phi Delta Year, a prestigious national award given to one member who best upholds the fraternity's ideals. Matt, congratulations. As chapter president in the fraternity, I kind of uh, make sure just basically everything's running smoothly. Father, thank thee for life, food, and for today. As you move throughout the campus, uh, you're, you're recognized as a Fidel instead of an individual, and um, I, I like that. It's early September. And Rush, when fraternities recruit new members, is right around the corner. Rush counselors, hold up your side. Coming up, at Ole Miss, Rush is in full swing. I told Garner that he didn't play here, I'd kill him. He told me he's going to kill me if, uh, if I didn't do if I don't. So, we'll see, though. For both America and American fraternal organizations, 1776 was the year of new beginnings. On December 5th in Williamsburg, Virginia, at the College of William Mary, the first society using Greek letters was founded. It was called Phi Beta Kappa. 
Like college literary societies of the time, the members of Phi Beta Kappa would debate a range of literary and philosophical ideas over pints at the Raleigh Tavern. Those young men at uh, William and Mary College were looking for something they could do on their own without having to get permission from their professors. I'm not even sure the professors even knew they, that they were forming uh, Phi Beta Kappa. What is the nature of law? What is the good society? How should hum human beings treat each other? Uh, these kinds of broader philosophical questions were not being addressed in the curriculum. The young men of Phi Beta Kappa were also bound together by rituals, a motto, an oath of fidelity, a secret handshake, and membership badges. By the turn of the century, Phi Beta Kappa had spread to other campuses. It was part of the growing impulse by students for greater control over their own lives. They were being by a president and a faculty who wanted to keep them in their place as boys who had to be obedient to all authority. In the post-revolutionary era, students were desperate to escape constricting rules and a domineering faculty. The board of, of administrators of colleges were ministers. A fellowship of Christians was okay, but a fellowship of brothers who uh, wanted to enjoy nothing more than a friendly debate or the company of each other was a threat to the way that colleges wanted things to be. I think the young men of 1800, they're no longer willing to tolerate the authority of, of presidents, professors, tutors. So what you get in, uh, in colleges and universities across the country is a wave of riots. Each riot seems to have a specific cause. Bad butter, some students being expelled. But if you look at them as they happened almost universally, you have to say something was in the air. In 1799, and again several years later, students rioted at the University of North Carolina. They stoned two professors and horsewhipped the president. At Princeton, after students disrupted morning prayers by loudly rubbing their boots on the wooden floor, they were expelled. Classmates went wild, shooting guns in the air, smashing walls and doors, and rolling stone-filled barrels through hallways. At Yale, students bombed a residence hall, and a tutor was killed as he tried to stop a fight. It would take years before colleges would come to accept student autonomy into academic life. But on this autumn day at the University of Mississippi, student organizations operate at the center of campus life, with the yearly ritual of fraternity recruitment, or rush, just days away. It's an unbiased way of allowing a new member, a potential new member, uh, a freshman or even a sophomore or junior who's not a member of a fraternity, to see equally the different experiences. Rush is a weeding out process. Fraternity members, or actives, and the freshmen, or rushees, size each other up over the course of several days. We don't have a good time. We don't have a good time. Each fraternity chapter offers invitations, or bids, to the rushees they most want, and the rushees, in the end, must ultimately decide which bid to accept. It's good. Yeah. I'll go where everyone likes me. The greatest pressure is to bring in quality guy. Hey, I'm on. How about you? How you doing? Jameson, Trip. You spend a lot of time researching the guys that are out on campus who aren't in houses. It's a really strange experience. As each senior class graduates, fraternities must recruit new members or pledges. Almost 800 University of Mississippi freshmen are participating in this rush process. They'll all get a bid from some fraternity, but what they really want is a bid from the right one. The stakes for everyone are high. For the rushies, it's, it's pretty stressful. Being in a rush for me is just, that's the most pressure I've ever had. And you see guys just crying, literally. They're walking down the sidewalks, just have no idea what they're gonna do, because family could be from one fraternity, their friends could be going to another fraternity, and it's just, it's one of the biz biggest decisions. Each university has devised its own rush process. At Ole Miss, it takes place over several days at the end of September. The uh, process is uh, based on three rounds and then bid day coming after the third round. During the first three rounds, as the rushies and actives evaluate each other, the chapters can issue bids whenever they choose. On the last day, bid day, rushies must decide which bid to accept. Nice to meet you, man. 
This chapter of Phi Delta Theta, founded 125 years ago, is one of the most prominent fraternities at Ole Miss. With over 100 actives, it must recruit 50 Rashis for the new pledge class. That responsibility falls mainly on the shoulders of chapter president, Matt McKenzie. Um, hope you did get a meet a couple guys. Uh, good luck through us. For Matt, recruitment is a crucial part of running a fraternity. It's all about selling the product and keeping one step ahead of the competition. First and foremost, we'd like to introduce two ladies to you guys who are very important over here at the Fight Out House. First is our sweetheart, Molly McKenzie. You look at it as a job in a way because it's something that has to get done to keep your fraternity afloat. Competition is certainly heated uh, throughout uh, the rush process. Uh, usually the um, most uh, three or four prestigious fraternities that everybody's really looking to join uh, are rushing a lot of the same guys. Round one of rush begins at the tail end of a hurricane, but a storm is the last thing that will stop these determined young men. We're like the Postal Service, nothing stops us. Freshman Curran Foos is feeling some family pressure to join Phi Delta Theta. Four generations of his family have been members there, including his brother Ransom, a junior. As a legacy, he's virtually a lock to get a bid. Pledges, I, it will be a great sense of pride. I, I will be very happy to have another one of my family members in here. And plus, he, he's not going to do anything but, you know, anything but good for this chapter. But for Curran, the big question is whether he'll accept a bid from Phi Delt or another fraternity. Before he left, we talked a little bit about it. My dad told me it's my, you know, he's not up here anymore, and it's my, it's, it's my four years and what fraternity I'm going to be in. You got to decide what you want to do, and I left it at that. But you know, I'm sure in the back of his mind, and he wants me to do Phi Delt. I put in a plug for Phi Delta State. I'll have to admit. It's my choice in the end. Each chapter, intent on assembling the best possible pledge class, must make a good impression on the Rushies. How you doing? Good. What's up, man? But the pressure is a two-way street. The Rushies must try to stand out, make a quick impression, and earn a bid from their top choice. When you go through us, you're looking for people like you. You've got to make a good impression, so. Yeah. Make you stand out from the yeah. other people. Yeah. I hope they remember you and like you. Hopefully at the bid session, they can bring your name up and give you a bid. I'm not going to get in. But man, it's cool, I had fun. Oh, because I was being a jackass and usually cocky people don't get into the fraternities that they want. It's a forced relationship building situation, which becomes very odd. Is this person talking to me because they want to get to know me or is this person talking to me because it's Rush? Um, so you don't know who is sincere and, and who's not. So I guess the purpose of Rush then is to figure out who's sincere and who, who, do, you, who do you best get along with. Round one has come to an end. We hope to see you tomorrow. The wear and tear is getting on to us a little bit. Curran is, if anything, even more unsure of his choice. Uh, I'm kind of confused about what I, what I want to do, who I want to be with for the next four years. Both similar to Fidel, or I'd say the out of the top three on campus, fraternity-wise. I feel pressure to join Fidel um, because of my, <laughs> just because of my brother, because uh, he told me he'd shoot me if I did Sigma Nu. Each year, tens of thousands of students nationwide participate in fraternity recruitment. Over the last several years, membership in the 83 national college fraternities has risen to around 400,000, with an alumni network of about 4.2 million. I think that students on college campuses are going to join groups. It might be the gaming club, it might be a, a religious organization, it might be the lacrosse team or the rugby team. You have a sense that you're a part of something that's been there for however many years, decades or centuries the fraternity's been there? Some people are obligated to, their parents make them. It's hard enough, I think, for anyone to deal with being away from home for the first time, but if you join a fraternity, just so much of, of that hard work is taken care of for you. You're growing all the time, and uh, the best way in the world to measure yourself um, is by other men. That's how we do it. Coming up, Rush picks up speed at Old Miss. Do you know the motto? I should know that, shouldn't I? I do. How to be prepared. 
I really couldn't tell you. It's in the yearbook. <laughs> we can tell you about Aristotle and Plato. <laughs> well, I know I did. I know I did at 4 a.m. every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night when we got called in there. The fraternity motto is culture for service, service for humanity. At the University of Mississippi, the second round of Rush, the yearly ritual to recruit new fraternity pledges, is underway. This is the fourth year that I've done this, and the guys are running just a little bit better than the girls. Oh, wow. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Second round, we uh, invite guys who we're extremely interested in, um, who, who have showed interest in us as well. We really don't know how they feel, and uh, I think some of them don't know how we feel. It's kind of trying to impress on both sides. Phi Delta Theta has identified several students as prime candidates and is courting them hard, including Curran Foos. For the Foos family, the Phi Delta connection may go back four generations, but Curran won't be pushed into making a choice until he's ready. I got a couple of days. It's, it's, it's nice to be one. I'd say I'd feel more of a connection to the people with Phi Delta, just because I've gotten to know them a lot better. But you know, I've been rushed by Sigma Nu pretty hard, and I, you know, I've gotten to know them, and I like them a whole lot. Fraternities here hand out bids or invitations to join throughout the three rounds of Rush, with early bids going to those students they especially covet. As round two starts, Chapter President Matt McKenzie invites Kern into room and utters the words his family first heard almost a century ago. You've got a bid from Phi Delta Theta and hope to see you here on Monday. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Congratulations. 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 Appreciate it. But Kern will wait to see if other fraternities will offer him a bid. All right, we'll see you more. Similar bonds of brotherhood throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries had formed among college students who were members of literary societies. Literary societies established libraries and let professors come and use them, working in a, a, a kind of harmony with the existing college. But in the 1820s, a new brotherhood was about to emerge that would be seen by college officials as far more treacherous. It was called the fraternity. Literary societies, starting in 1750, were created to create public men. Fraternities, as they began in the 1820s, were formed to create worlds of private pleasure. And so they formed societies so that they could enjoy the fellowship of brothers, uh, enjoy the pleasures of some secret rituals, and enjoy the private pleasures of drinking and gambling away from college eyes. If, if they'd been seen by their professors or their tutors, they would have been expelled. Fraternities adopted more than their names from ancient Greece. The Greeks are proclaimed to be the founders of democracy, in Europe at least, and they presented themselves as being concerned about values that go beyond mere survival. They invented for their culture things like music and art and politics and philosophy. They chose the Greek statements and creeds as the, ba the basis for their organizations to symbolize that it was about furthering knowledge and that it was something a little bit different than the literary societies that had existed beforehand. At Union College in upstate New York, the first fraternities, Kappa Alpha, Sigma Phi, and Delta Phi, founded in the mid-1820s. They were called the Union Triad and created the structure on which today's fraternities are based. As they spread to other campuses, literary societies began their decline. But fierce opposition to fraternities grew rapidly. Off-campus, it was fueled by anti-Masonic and anti-secret society groups. They were an odd mix of religious evangelicals who saw fraternities as decadent and anti-Christian, and political liberals who saw these secret rituals as a threat to basic democratic values. On campus, college officials had their own reasons to combat fraternities. Administrations did not want fraternities in the early 19th century. There's no question about that. Would you like to have young people having a secret society in your midst, devoted to goals quite opposite to the primary goals with which you're there? I mean, you're there to teach them the ways of the mind and the ways of godliness. They're there to have fun. In 1832, the president of Union College threatened students in a speech. The first young 
person who joins a secret society shall not remain in college one hour. Colleges and universities banned the fraternities as a way of trying to keep the students in place, keep the students' attentions and energies focused on the classroom. And because of this ban, the fraternities became more secretive. In 1841 at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, the Board of Trustees demanded all students resign from fraternities. The organizations did not disband, but instead went underground. In the winter of 1848, angry students protesting the university president blockaded buildings and destroyed property. Many students, including all fraternity members, were expelled, and the Greek system shut down. But fraternities were a force that could not be stopped. The Night of Round Two. The fraternity members at the University of Mississippi meet late into the night to vote on which other Rashids to offer bids the next day. We'll have bid sessions that night, uh, trying to get some guys who came back that we're real interested in. Each fraternity has its own highly ritualized voting process. All right, guys, I'm bringing up Ryan Davis from Jackson, Mississippi. In unprecedented access, Phi Delta Theta shows us a typical bid meeting that always takes place behind closed doors. It's actives only and they look not just for compatibility in the rush candidates, but shared values as well. We play varsity soccer his freshman year, varsity football his sophomore through senior year. Let's get this thing rolling and uh, bid him up. If you know him, please stand up. Yeah. I know Ryan. I call him Looper. <laughs> He's one of the best guys I've ever met. We do need to get back into Jackson. This guy is a big old fat jolly guy. If you just heard his laugh, if you just heard his laugh, you would love this guy. He's come down to New Orleans with me and gone gator hunting a bunch of times. He's just as cool a kid as you can ever imagine. Right now, we're looking for guys that embody what we're about, and uh, no one does that better than Mr. Ron Davis. So let's yeah. give him a After the speeches, all members must vote by pushing either marbles or dice through a hole in a wooden box. Marble indicates a yes vote. A die, also referred to as a ball, is a no vote. To offer a bid, the vote must be unanimous. Two balls. That means two no votes, and so they try again. Let's talk about his morals for a little while. I mean, this guy will help us in intramurals. If Trey trusts him, and Ransom and Will like him, I think this guy deserves the best. <coughs> Next day, round three, the final round. By now, all the fraternities have offered bids to the Rushies they want. This is their last chance to convince them to join their chapter. We want them to exactly know what we're like. What you're trying to do third round is to leave them here not being undecided, knowing what they want to do right when they walk out the front door, that they want to be a Fidel. The process is not without politics and maneuvering. The Fidelts push Curran hard to accept their bid. My brother, I mean, he puts the pressure on me just because, like, you know, we won't be as good friends if I do something else, and that's probably the main pressure because, uh, you know, we're pretty close now. The Fidelts believe his decision might also sway several other freshmen from his hometown of Mobile, Alabama. You have more in common with the guys here than anywhere else. But Curran didn't tell anyone that the day before his decision was made for him. I went to seven yesterday and uh, they didn't give me a bid. I was disappointed because, you know, I've had some guys rush me pretty hard over there. And, uh, you know, when I talked to them first round, they said, you know, I can, we can give you a bid if possible. So that kind of led me on maybe thinking they were, they were going to give me a bid. But they also said we don't want to waste a bid. Because I wanted one kind of, you know, to just so, you know, I could, could have a decision. Kern accepted the bid from Phi Delta Theta. All right, guys, let's right, dad, so. dad call uh -huh. tell you. Say he's proud of you. All right, good to have you here, buddy. By the end of round three, all the fraternities have made their bids. For the other Rashids, it's now decision time. Kern's choice turned out to be an easy one. It was made for him. But for other freshmen, it's a gut-wrenching decision. Bid day is just really an exciting time we have all these students who are going to these new organizations and becoming members of these new groups, and there's just a lot of excitement in the air. Phi Delta Theta issued 75 bids and 55 students accepted. One thing about a pledge ceremony typically is that the secret values of the organization 
which are told in the initiation ceremony to men who are becoming brothers, are many times disguised in other words or blended into the pledge ceremony somewhere. So that when an individual is pledging themselves to the organization and they're hearing the things in the pledge ceremony, the new member ceremony, they actually are hearing the values and the purpose of the organization. I welcome you to a group of men whose brotherhood you have chosen and desire because of the kind of men you believe them to be. The pledge ceremony is one of many rituals that distinguish one fraternity from another. Now the player, now the player, that I pledge myself and my services, that I pledge myself and my services to the Phi Delta Theta fraternity. To the Phi Delta Theta fraternity. I was surrounded by guys my own age and, and I where I had felt disenfranchised at a school, I suddenly felt like I had this immediate set of friends, the same way you would feel on an athletic team, where you don't maybe necessarily know everyone, but you have this kind of fraternal thing of being part of 50 guys. And um, it became the, the single best experience that I had in college. There's got to be something that draws the group together, something that makes the betas different than the SAEs, the sigma chi's different than the KAs, and that's the ritual. Ritual should dictate and, and in its essence, should dictate how the individual and the group acts. These rituals, whether a pledge ceremony or a secret password, serve to connect members to their roots. It's an esoteric drama that they perform. It should be a reminder of the past, but it also should be a compass or a direction for the future. Of course, every chapter has their own handshake that's secret. Our, our secret handshake was just wrapping the pinky around. Think any other day. When you run into a member of your organization, I know that they went through the exact sequence of a ritual to become initiated into the society that I did. It wasn't until I began to go through it uh, from the active side or the brotherhood side that I began to appreciate the wisdom and the concepts and the symbolism and the, and the very strong sense of values that was inherent in the ritual. Coming up, student deaths from hazing and alcohol abuse threatened the survival of college fraternities. Within a few seconds, uh, beers were being thrust into my hand, and um, I wasn't a drinker, and within, and within the hour, I had passed out. They want to get you in the mind and screw around with your mind a little bit to get you to think about that right there. What am I doing? Why am I, putting my, why am I letting myself be susceptible to this? In 1861, as the Civil War began, Southern college students and fraternity members were swept up in the waves of Confederate fervor. On many campuses, including the University of Mississippi, the result was devastating. The, the entire student body left. It was all male. Everybody went to, to fight for the Confederacy. And so thus, the university closed, the fraternities closed. Not only was the Greek system itself depleted but we had a whole generation of young men lost in that war. After the Civil War, the fraternity movement reorganized itself. New fraternities were being started, many of them being started by students who had served in the Confederacy. Many of them wanted to hold on to what they knew before the war. But change was in the air as colleges came to finally accept and even welcome student self-government. You have intercollegiate athletics, you still have the societies, residence halls. Student life began to expand outside of the classroom, and partly because the colleges and universities were growing larger. Sororities were part of that expansion. Alpha Delta Pi, founded in 1851, paved the way as the first secret society for college women. Pi Beta Phi and Kappa Alpha Theta followed suit as the first fraternities for women. By the late 19th century, fraternities were flourishing. Chapters were small, though, usually with no more than 12 members, and few of them had their own residences. They held meetings in taverns, restaurants, and churches. They would meet anywhere they could put 10 to 15 men to enjoy dinner, a smoke, and great conversation. But as alumni grew wealthy, their donations allowed chapters to buy land and build houses. That signaled a seismic shift in Greek life. Once students shared a residence, the focus more than ever turned from academic pursuits to their social life and extracurricular activities. 
But members now also had to handle more ordinary pragmatic tasks, mowing lawns, fixing plumbing, paying taxes, and feeding and housing their brothers. Performing household tasks is still a big part of fraternity life today, especially for a pledge. He is essentially on probation over a period of several months. Until the day of initiation, he must show his dedication, drive, and zeal to become a brother. The point of a pledge program is to teach that individual about that chapter. You know, they teach them things about being Greek. Uh, they teach them the Greek alphabet. You know, they teach them uh, why fraternities were formed, what the fraternity means. A pledge's responsibilities are wide ranging. You have to be here at 5 o'clock for dinner and uh, about six pledges each week, Monday through Wednesday, serve dinner. And uh, every pledge after dinner cleans up dinner. They can be seen around the house painting, waxing floors, sweeping, wow. vacuuming rooms, cleaning bathrooms, stuff like that. So, And I'm sure they're getting tired of that as well. They have to be up here at study halls every night. That's one big thing. Uh, you can't get, get initiated unless you have a 225 GPA at least. They need to know every man in the chapter, know exactly where they're from. They have to do a certain amount of community service before they can get initiated. But there's time for fun, too. Tomorrow we'll be having an intramural football game, pledges against actives. Kind of gives us an opportunity to go out there and push each other around. I know they're, they're tired of us telling them what they need to do. And uh, uh, right now they're probably in better shape than we are, so I expect them probably to run the table on us. For fraternities, fun has sometimes been a little hard to swallow. For some of the guys, um, they feel like it's a rite of passage. Um, not only for the actors, but for the pledges. They're proving how bad that they want it. These kinds of antics have been part of college life ever since fraternities came into existence. Very early on, in the history of Harvard, young men were caught stealing poultry in Cambridge. Young men were caught drinking and gambling. Our fraternity would give us, give us very odd jobs that just seemed impossible at the time. This is a great one. Now, you've been partying all night, right? You've had a big game that Saturday, and you've been partying all night, and it's three in the morning, and you're cleaning up, and all of a sudden, one of the members gets up and has wild hair and calls you all out in the yard and gives you some kind of duty you got to do in, <laughs> you know, somewhere all scattered around town. And you better have it. You better have all this treasure hunt taken care of and everything back here by tomorrow night at six. Or you'd have them come down and you'd have your, your pop quizzes, your trivia in the morning. There's a lot of other things I probably, you know, won't talk about that, uh, that, that we went through that, uh, that definitely needed the guy next to you, you know. There are some challenges, you know, of to, to find out whether or not that individual has what it takes to be a member, how dedicated that person is to the group. And that's where, you know, a lot of the um, dangers of, of, of pledging come into play, um, you know, where they make them do physical challenges and things like that. But many believe that these mental or physical challenges are not just boys being boys. They say it's hazing. That can mean physical violence, student against student, fraternity brother against brother which has led to young men dying. In 1994, Michael Davis, a pledge at a fraternity at Southeast Missouri State University, participated in a series of hazing rituals. After days of beatings and after suffering head injuries, internal bleeding, broken ribs, a lacerated kidney and liver, Michael Davis died. Seven fraternity members were convicted of involuntary manslaughter. Well, there was a difference in the hazing of 1960 and the hazing that I find on the college campus today. The hazing of 1960 was a lot of buffoonery, a lot of silliness. The hazing of this time, much more serious, much more physical. Hazing goes as far back as the Middle Ages, when freshmen at European universities were considered uncivilized and were subjected to physical abuse and extortion. It's believed that the word hazing, supposedly taken from the old French word meaning to frighten, was first used in the mid-19th century, but it would soon evolve into a distinctly American phenomenon. And there were a number of things we would construe as hazing that were imposed on students in the 1890s. If you were a freshman and you were walking along a sidewalk and a senior was coming, you had to step into the mud to get out of the way. Uh, you had to wear a beanie. You had to dress in a certain way. But ironically, 
as fraternities joined the campus mainstream, they also became more deadly. Academic experts estimate that as many as 40 students over the last few decades have died from fraternity-related hazing incidents. I joined a chapter that hazed. I fell into the trap of thinking this is how we, we, we create good brothers. You know, there's things you do that you're like, give me a break. It will be the one thing that will kill a chapter quicker than anything because it is so far away from the basic principle of what the chapter says it is. But that's where really you get a coalition and group starts to come together because you do have people that go man i've had it i quit and you rally around that guy and you say man if you really want to be here come on man just stick through it this is what they're trying to get you to do is quit that will never bond you to another human being because really what you're what you're talking about in life as well as a fraternity is who can you trust my test for hazing that i talk to students about is videotape it ask yourself would you show this to your parents and say this is what your son does would you show it to the parents of the young men who pledge and say, this is how we treat your son? And would you show it to the prospects who are coming next year and say, this is how you'll be treated? And if you can't answer yes, you know, don't do it. The lethal consequences can no longer be ignored. National fraternities are finally taking action. Hazing goes on in clubs, bands, athletic teams, high schools. But of all those groups, men's fraternities and women's fraternities and sororities are really the few that have stepped up and said, not only are we opposed to it, we are going to eliminate it, we are going to address it. Some national fraternities have closed down offending chapters, and many have stated their opposition to hazing in their charters. That's given a measure of comfort to some students. Joining an anti-hazing fraternity for me was important because it allowed me to protect my dignity and my personal uh, security my personal safety. I was unsure as a freshman what was going to happen potentially in joining a fraternity. It's, it's somewhat questionable. You don't really know what you're getting into. Hazing is a crime and is banned in 43 states, including Mississippi, but it still goes on. It's like crabgrass. It's going to come up almost every year. You can defeat it and a year later you're going to start seeing it come up again. The real men are those who step up and say, not in my house you're not going to do it. It's going to take similar courage to face another significant, more widespread problem, alcohol abuse. The time that one of my fraternity brothers uh, chased a glass of vodka with a men in speed stick, that was one of the most frightening things I'd ever seen. He drank a full glass of vodka and had nothing to, to chase it with. He picked up a men in speed stick that was on my desk, ripped off the top, and, and, and just took a big, giant bite out of it and then proceeded to throw up all over the hall. I didn't even know I was in a fraternity. I'm telling you, I was drunk within an hour, and I had passed out. I mean, literally, I had passed out. I was in their trophy room. I had my arm around a girl, and she was gone about two hours later. And I was, I was, um, I woke up in a fog hearing voices. It's everywhere, whether we want it to be or not. It's far different than quaffing a brotherly stein these days. I mean, it's, uh, it's abusive drinking. Some incidents have led to student deaths and over the last decade have drawn increased media attention. Today, they threaten the very survival of the fraternity system. If we know a brother has a drinking problem, uh, do we, are we com compelled by that ritual to confront that brother or to help him? You know, and in its purest sense, it should be working like that. Unfortunately, somehow, it's not. A number of schools, including Colby College, have tackled fraternity alcohol abuse and hazing by abolishing the Greek system entirely. In 2002, at Alfred University, 21-year-old Benjamin Klein was found dead after a night of drinking and being beaten by his fraternity brothers. Though his death was not directly linked to the assault, a university task force found the fraternity system beyond repair, and the trustees voted to eliminate fraternities and sororities but some believe that there is a better way. If they have a fraternity facility, that facility must be substance free. Some fraternities are offering scholarships and incentives for their fraternities to be substance free. So on paper, it looks very good. It, it gets very difficult for the national chapters to be, to be effective because they're, they're taking on a mountain with, with a little shovel. Coming up, a lot of power 
does have to do with the ability to convince or intimidate others, and maybe some of this is learned in the fraternity house. By the 20th century, the fraternity had become a dominant force on most college campuses. Dances, pep rallies, homecoming, the editor of the paper, the football team. It was very hard to find something that fraternities and sororities did not have influence or some say in how life was happening on the campus. It was also the beginning of minority fraternities. In 1898, in response to religious discrimination, the first Jewish fraternity, Zeta Beta Ta, was founded at several New York City colleges. In 1906, Alpha Phi Alpha, the first African-American fraternity, was founded at Cornell University. It was a huge jump from slavery during which blacks were not even allowed to read on penalty of death to moving into a sphere where you finish college. They wanted to do that. And they not only wanted to finish college, they wanted to have doctors and lawyers and politicians. And fraternities actually enhanced that because that's what they were about. By the roaring 20s, fraternities had entered mainstream pop culture. Cartoons, movies, Broadway shows all depicted fraternities as dedicated to the holy pursuit of fun. Fraternities and sororities become the dominant way after 1920, there's no question about it, at least up until the 1960s. Some campuses' fraternities are somewhere between a fourth to a third of the student bodies. At some, they are in the majority. As America entered World War II, young men raced to enlist in the war effort, and college enrollment and fraternity membership declined dramatically. In one fraternity alone, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, nearly 19,000 young men served in the armed forces. Almost 900 died. After the war, the GI Bill allowed veterans to return to school in large numbers, and fraternities bloomed once again. But something had changed. You got to remember that we left here as children, and, and we had an experience that would make you grow up in a hurry. They're older. They have a different notion of what life offers them. They've experienced war, and for many, that's a very sobering element in their lives. Well, I was in Ole Miss in 1940 as a freshman and I placed that out of theta. I volunteered in December 42, and I wound up uh, being uh, a navigator on the B-17, uh, flying uh, in Europe, and I was discharged in October of 1945 and came back to Ole Miss in February of 1946. I'd say after the war, everybody was much more serious. Today, fraternity life at Ole Miss is as strong as ever. In the days before homecoming weekend, the 55 pledges at Phi Delta Theta have been building their float for the big parade. We have that hammer over here? I've worked on some construction. I, I worked for an antique place two years in a row, so you know, I've hammered a good bit in my life, so I kind of know what I'm doing. During the pledge process, which extends the entire semester, they work on other projects that help pull them together as a team. First couple of times a pledge class comes together to take on a project, it's chaos. No one knows how to do what. After a couple of, after a few times, you all gather together and you say, all right, you know this builder over at so-and-so is this wood. Uh, Mark, you know this person who can get this for the party. And all of a sudden you start coming together and people, you scatter people out, you delegate and you come together and all of a sudden you're, you're a hell of a lot more efficient at getting a job done. Whether it's building a float, cramming for exams, or sharing a meal, the bonds these pledges forge today are ones that will last. You talk about anything with anything and everything with one of your pledge builders, you know, it goes from class to, you know, I'm worried about this, to, you know, I think I want to start dating this girl. I mean, I had too good of a time last night, shouldn't have done that, you know. These are the guys that are going to be in their weddings. These are the guys that are going to be godfathers to their children. The opportunities for jobs is unbelievable. If you've got a child and he's interested in something, your alumni are going to find a way to get him to the very best that they can. The networking is amazing. Guy I knew vaguely my freshman year, he was a senior, uh, actually got in touch with me about possibly uh, interning with his investment bank from Los Angeles last summer. Um, we went back and forth, I sent him a resume, he told me about his firm. I ended up working there over the summer. Um, I'm going to end up working there when I graduate in May. So, But some see networking as a distortion of a fraternity's true purpose. I don't believe that 
a person should have an automatic access to something, especially if it's something he doesn't deserve to have access to, simply because he is related to a connection like a fraternity. I would hate to go into a fraternity that way. I mean, I'm glad I found my way in face down. You know, I, um, I, I don't like to be that calculating in my life. After graduation, many of these young Greeks, like their predecessors, will wield tremendous power at the top of the political, corporate, and social ladders. A lot of power does have to do with the ability to convince or intimidate others, and maybe some of this is learned in the fraternity house. The fact that so many who are in a fraternity achieve success is a trip to those great qualities and characteristics of what a fraternity is all about. Coming up, the ultimate power network, secret societies. With a place like a secret society, especially like Skull and Bones, uh, you have doors open to you with Supreme Court chief justices, presidents of the United States, business tycoons, and CIA officials. There are no secret societies here on Columbia, from what I know. I was convinced that there was a building over there that had no windows. It was a secret society, but it turned out to be a water house. November the 15th and 16th, we'll be celebrating our 125th anniversary. For Karin Foos and the other Fidel pledges, initiation is two months away. The pledging experience has brought them all closer together. You bond through the pledge process because you get to know them a lot better than anybody else, just basically through conversation, spending time together with them. He seems to be excelling, you know, they got a good group of friends, and they say, he seems to be one of the leaders. You know, and I'm proud of both of them, but, uh, uh, and that would have been true regardless, but uh, it's, it's, it's an extra sense of uh, pride, that extra amount of pride. I mean, it's, it's nice to come up here and see them, uh, see them together. And, uh, it's funny, it meant a lot to my father, uh, more so than I would have thought it was when we pledged Fight After Theta, but looking back, I understand now the uh, sense of pride that he did, did feel. During the 1960s and 70s, the American fraternity system was on the ropes. America was in crisis. The Vietnam War, political assassinations, civil rights struggles, drug use, and urban riots polarized the nation and college campuses were often the center of the storm. Fraternities quickly became an endangered species. They seemed less and less pertinent to young people who were either involved in political protest or with getting on with their lives. It was a, a, a relic of an earlier era. The drug culture, the counterculture, they really undermined all of the appeal that the Greek system had. Fraternities suffered a sharp decline in enrollment and influence. A common catchphrase of the day was, the Greeks are dying. Their standing on American campuses had been seriously damaged. But a network of student organizations was flourishing, as they had for centuries and as they still do today. Secret societies give you access to a vast network that other organizations won't give you. It's more than just an alumni network. This is the top of the top, the, the cream of the crop here. Secret societies resemble fraternities in several respects. They operate on college campuses, though primarily for seniors. Some of them incorporate Masonic traditions, and they are highly ritualized with secret handshakes, passwords, and mottos. But secret societies differ significantly from Greek letter societies. Secret societies are not about doing community service, are not about bettering the human they're about bettering themselves. Alexandra Robbins has written a book about secret societies, including the most infamous one of all, based at Yale University, Skull and Bones. Unlike fraternities, secret societies keep their agendas and their membership hidden from the rest of campus. They're not about to hold an open party, for example, with, with, with kegs for the rest of campus. Most of the secret societies are specific to a campus or to a group of campuses, maybe the Ivy League system or something like that. With a fraternity, you have, you, you see up front, you know who's in it, you know what they're about, they'll tell you, they're like, this is what we're gonna do, you've been to their parties, you know, you know what kind of people hang out there. Um, with a secret society, you, you're going in blind and you're, you know, you don't know what you're gonna get. And you don't really have a way out. But I think the biggest difference is that 
At a fraternity, you might have an alumni network where perhaps you'll get a foot in the door at Joe Schmo's law firm and, and secure an interview. Whereas with a place like a secret society, especially like Skull and Bones, uh, you have open to you with Supreme Court chief justices, presidents of the United States, business tycoons, and CIA officials. George W. Bush, his father, his grandfather, and many other Bushes were members of Skull and Bones. Uh, Senator John Kerry is also a member of Skull and Bones, which could make the presidential election of 2004 particularly interesting. Secret societies evolved from a mixture of social and religious ideals and rituals extending back almost a thousand years to the early 12th century, when the Knights Templar, a mysterious monastic order of the Catholic Church, was allegedly founded in Palestine. The first secret society in America was FHC, or the Flat Hat Club. It was formed in 1750 at the College of William and Mary, and supposedly included Thomas Jefferson as a member. But throughout the centuries, FHC has not been alone. There are actually secret societies on many campuses across the country. People join secret societies for many reasons, one of which is the allure of the power, prestige, and perhaps money involved both on campus and after graduation. The most notorious of them all, Alan Bones has generated a wealth of theories about its broad and sinister powers. There's all kinds of rumors on the internet, you know, vast conspiracies about how it has to do with the Illuminati and, you know, people that rule the world. Skull and Bones is generally believed to run a secret world government. It's rumored to be a wealthy landowner that guarantees its members power and financial security for life. And people generally ascribe to Skull and Bones everything from foreign policy disasters to one of my personal favorites, the horrors of the Dewey Decimal System. Skull and Bones was allegedly founded in the early 1830s by William H. Russell, a student with connections to a German secret society that used similar symbols and rituals. All of the secret societies at Yale were modeled after Skull and Bones, which has a very strong death motif inside with skeletons, skulls, a mummy, coffins. It's an interesting structure. Essentially what it consists of is a group of, you know, between 10 and 20 people who get together, you know, once or twice a week um, and they get to know each other. And it's a way, I think, to bring closure to the college experience. Um, I mean, it's a way to get to know that you wouldn't know otherwise. And it's, when it's framed in that, in, in that way, it's hard to say that it's a bad thing. But whether the mystique of secret societies is strong enough to keep them going remains a big question. I think they're making a comeback, especially with Skull and Bones at the helm. When you have a political dynasty coming from Skull and Bones, that elevates secret societies. They're simply going to thrive on that, and I think that's what's been happening and what's going to continue to happen for a while. When we return, tradition continues at Ole Miss as initiation finally arrives. The growth of college fraternities in the 1980s was unprecedented. Between 1980 and 1986 alone, the Greek population exploded from 230,000 to 400,000. But in the last decade of the 20th century, membership took an equally dramatic downturn. From 1990 through 1999, fraternities were in a spiral because we kept attracting individuals who were just in it for the party. Some observed believe that fewer serious candidates stemmed from a number of factors, including growing media attention on hazing and alcohol abuse. As the century came to a close, fraternities began to seriously confront these problems, and enrollment began to climb once again. From 1999 through the present time, we have enjoyed a growth of probably 3% a year. At the University of Mississippi, fraternities have for years been a cornerstone of student life. For the last four months, Karin Foos and other freshmen have been pledging at Phi Delta Theta. Initiation day, when they become full brothers or actives, is finally at hand. I mean, Dad's gonna be I know Mr. Quinn, and I think uh, two Saints. I'm anxious to get initiated. You know, only Phi Delta can go to that, so it's a special ceremony. Uh, I'm sure my dad's pretty excited about coming up here. He uh, <laughs> pinned my brother and he's going to pin me with my grandfather's pin, I believe. It's a total 180 going from a place to if you're just if you're just moving in a whole different direction. Just just walking into the house is a different feeling from being a pledge to an active. When you're a pledge, you, you know you, you feel like you have to answer to someone. When you're an active, you, that, this means they get to start going to chapter meetings. You just feel like you're more part of the chapter. Out of 55 freshmen who pledged in September, only 26 have made it all the way to becoming initiated as brothers. Some dropped out of school. Others couldn't make the fraternity's minimum grade requirements. 
For the remaining pledges, they just have to make it through the last week. It's called Hell Week. This week was uh, just pretty bad. You don't go to bed till about 2.30, wake up at 6, come up here. You basically are in the hole. It's just the room upstairs that's designated as the hole where all pledges are, and that's where we stay all day if you're not in class. You stay in there for 15, 16 hours. It's kind of like bittersweet. When you're going through pledge ship, you think while you're going through that it's, you know, it's kind of bad. But then you look back on it, and you're like, because you spent your time with all your pre pledge brothers, and uh, it was a little better than you thought it was. It's not coincidence that those particular guys in my pledge class were have become best friends of mine because we went through something that was very challenging. Every fraternity has its own Hell Week rituals. They have to wait on tables. They're also at the beck and call of all the brothers, cleaning their rooms or ferrying them around campus. I'm taking the class. You sure you want me to? Yes, come on. Uh, go coon in there. No, come on. Right. But things turn a little more solemn as the initiation ceremony, rarely seen by outsiders, is about to begin. Uh, the initiation process is, is a very serious uh, moment in a young man's life. He has passed all tests. He has um, gained the acceptance of the active brothers. The actual process usually takes place over several days. Guys, congratulations. You've reached the first night of initiation, uh, first round. Um, you were met with a challenge when you pledged here at Phi Delta Theta, and you've lived up to it. Uh, remember this night. Don't, don't take it for granted. This is something you're going to remember for the rest of your lives. Everything has a meaning. Everything is, there is symbolism behind almost everything that, in a fraternity. It's that during that initiation ceremony uh, or celebration that the, uh, the new member has the opportunity to learn those things. Every aspect of what takes place in the initiation in plants a value that is really quite idealistic and even today I think of it in a very beautiful way. This is the final and uh, ending part where you'll get some closure finally to your pledge ship. I've seen you all grow as men in your first couple months in college here. I expect that you'll continue to grow and just make this chapter even better than it actually is. So if you would please rise and follow Matt, he'll lead you upstairs. The rest of the initiation process is secret. Only members of Phi Delta Theta are allowed beyond this point. Sorry, gentlemen. Can't go any further. It's a time that the chapter comes together uh, one last time where they all become active brothers together and truly are do act as one. The night that, you know, it was up, pledge ship was over and the hell week was over uh, was a you know, very fulfilling rite of passage, man. I mean, it felt great. And that sense of belonging felt good. You know, it felt real good. We just uh, finished the final act of initiation. Um, of course, it's a little secret. I can't go into too much depth. I was going to ask you to show me the secret handshake. Yeah, don't know it yet. But if you knew it, would you show it to me? Uh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to kill you. Yeah. As fraternities enter the 21st century, their path is not clearly mapped out and their survival even less so. Yes, I think they will survive, but I don't think they're gonna survive in the manner in which they have proceeded along historically. If fraternities are to be relevant in the 21st century, they need to get back to their core values upon which they were founded to be more about scholarship, to be more about service, to be more about their, their fellow man. Other changes are in the wind, including co-ed fraternities at schools such as Dartmouth. And technology is also dramatically altering how students interact with each other and the way fraternities operate. Internet sites, email distribution lists, virtual chapter meetings, they do not need to leave their room. They do not need to visit their common space and interact with their brothers the way that they did 30 years ago when those conveniences did not exist in the fraternity facilities. So I see fraternity chapters not as intimate as maybe they once were. However these organizations evolve over the next century, one thing remains clear. The fraternity experience for many of these men, young and old, has changed their lives forever. The connections that we make here are lifelong because we've gone through so much together now that it would be very hard to forget, almost impossible to forget each other. I enjoyed the all-male experience that I had with guys and friends and stories with guys from different parts of the country that had different experiences and you start finding out that, hey man, 
Yeah, it happened to you too, just like this, just a different way. Oh, y'all do the same thing in Minnesota that we've been doing in Texas, y'all just do it a different way. Mostly what I think about are late night talks of being with guys your own age, guys that when you actually broke it down, what they were worried about is, is trying to graduate, trying to find their way through life. You'd look amongst the 40 or 50 guys and you could see people who were already lost. You could see people who were trying to find their way. You could see a whole life force in front of you. And, um, but what I think back on and what I think about the most are late at night talking with my fraternity brothers, the ones that are, you know, in certain instances still in my life.